it's been such a an overwhelming um, experience and honor to listen and see and partake. Um, and in a slightly Dadaist way, I thought that I would come today not in my role necessarily as a, a creative writer, but uh, throw things off center by coming as a critic um, and also as a labor activist. So I work as a campaigner in the film industry um, around exploitative uh, and exclusionary labor practices, um, which is a lot of work and I'm making no headway whatsoever. So I'm not gonna talk about it at all because it's just depressing. Um, but I want to use the fact of that hat to really um, hold and perhaps amplify back what I heard all of the speakers today saying about the work that they do, the work of working in the archives, the physical work, the emotional work, the spiritual work um, of working with ancestors, working with grief, um, working with absences and presences, um, and working with contemporary institutions um, that may try and co-opt our work um, or have their own uses for it. Um, and to think about that physicality, both in the terms of a, a labor politics and maybe that's something we can talk about in the discussion in terms of how we recognize that, how we campaign around that, how we hold that for ourselves. Um, and also of access. Um, I'm really having um, just listened to Janice talk in such granular detail about that exact work of, of access, of having this list of names and then trying to force these exploitative withholding institutions to make it possible for you to do your work when they should be celebrating and including and rewarding and possibilizing it for you instead of um, further um, gatekeeping. And just thinking about the physicalization of that in Ocker's photograph of the boxes on the top shelf. So if we're thinking about access in an archive, how it's that photograph is so exemplary for me because we're so often trying to access what's on the top shelf, what's um, in a salt mine in Utah, in the case of some of my own work, um, what is in dusty drawers because it's considered unimportant, what's been mislabeled or unlabeled, um, as Saidia Hartman talks about in her work. Um, and thinking about how, um, Rosa Johan, you made that visible with the auto cue, the hidden labor of performance in your performances. Um, and how we hold and acknowledge all of this physicality matters um, in relation to, to Oka's question, um, what is a good body? Because that question has been so controlling for art history and for Eurocentric and Euro Western arts and culture and the way that arts and culture have been mobilized um, to do exclusionary work. That's often referred to as soft power, but there's nothing soft about how it's done. Um, the, the good body, um, in particular in arts and culture, in arts and culture gatekeeping in particular is one that is such a good body, it's not a body at all. It has no embodied or bodily requirements other than being an ubermensch, perfectly, exceptionally abled, exceptionally empowered. And I'm using that, introducing that awful Nietzschean uh, that term from Friedrich Nietzsche, because what I'm working on at the moment is um, about the legacy of um, Nazism and Nazi ideas of the body as itself bad um, uh, through a concept uh, that did not originate uh, with National Socialism, but with an earlier German Jewish art historian. And I would say ironically, but there's nothing ironic as we know about how things are internalized and then reappropriated. And that concept is summed up in the word entaltete, um, which is usually translated into English as degenerate. Um, and, but actually means accepted from the set of all sets. So literally it has no genre, it has no way of belonging, it has, it doesn't belong in the field um, of existence. And this word was taken from um, Max Nordau's art history where he used it to critique 
the kind of movements that would lead towards Dada, like symbolism. He was critiquing 19th century artists who were exploring um, often themselves in exploitative and appropriative ways. If we think of an artist like Baudelaire, they were exploring the transgressive, they were exploring the irrational, they were exploring what they saw as the limits or the outsides of European culture, which themselves depended um, on exploiting um, colonized peoples and uh, their knowledge um, and appropriating it to perform their own transgression. So that's that's where the term Antarctica was coined. And Dadaism was itself a response to this. It was saying, well, okay, this is what you think bad art is. This is what you think the bad romance of art is. That's what we're going to do. Everything you say is bad, we're going to do it. We're going to embrace the irrational, the nonsensical, um, the deconstructive. Of course, the critique, as, as Lottie said and as Claire said, did not um, look towards the, the root of where those critiques came from. So it was, it was limited by its own Eurocentrism. Um, and then in 1937, Joseph Goebbels decided that he would use both the forms of Dada art itself and the idea of Antarctica to expropriate artworks, over 20,000 artworks, um, from predominantly Jewish art collectors and owners, um, but also from museums, and to exhibit them in an enormous propagandistic exhibition that was designed to instruct people that were considered to be German Germans into how to see the bodies and artists that were exhibited. So this is soft power. And in the title of the exhibition, which was Entartete Kunst, Degenerate Art, the word art was put in quotation marks. So at every level, all of these operations, which we see in our own cultural institutions still being perpetuated. This is not some exceptionalized Nazi practice. It's something that is still continued. Um, and I'm not showing pictures of the exhibition specifically because they were designed to offend. Um, the exhibition was specifically held in an archaeology museum that held expropriated works from areas of Africa that the Germans had colonized. And there was a deliberate blurring um, and misframing of the relationship between these works and works by modernist artists. Um, in many cases, the racialization um, or national identity of that artist was identified on the caption of the work, but the thing that was always noticed was the work's value in Marx and who it was owned by. So this, I think, um, goes to exactly what Rosa Johan was saying about the fact that visibility and projection of spatial relations, their architectural relations, they're implemented by the cultural spaces we work in. And Oka also brought up the word caption and captioning. Um, which are, we think are strategies of accessibility, but are often used as strategies of conformity and removal of information. So the Entalta to Kunst exhibition deliberately used parodies of Dada slogans painted on the walls as a way to misinform, confuse, infuriate, exceptionalize, uh, and produce this um, sense of confusion um, exactly this, uh, this bad romance, I think, a phrase that we're going to keep going back to um, in the relationship between the viewers and the art. So as I'm, I'm writing about this um, from a perspective of someone who is queer and non-binary, from a perspective of someone who's Ashkenazi Jewish, I'm thinking about how we, um, to use the, the word used by the Mayday runes, how do we activate this archive um, without replicating it? and thinking exactly about uh, what Jay was saying in their video about using repertoire, using embodied knowledge um, as a form of activation when interpreting the archive. So these objects don't stay in the archive, uh, particularly objects that were exhibited in that exhibition and then destroyed, and of which some, in some cases the only record we have is photographs of their miss exhibition or of their expropriation, their cataloging. Um, so I'm also thinking a lot about cataloging because the Nazis were ex obsessive catalogers and taxonomizers. Um, and what they were doing through those practices, which came from Linnaean and Darwinian biology and how um, what we think of as Nazism or fascism are already explicit within taxonomizing practices in biology that then come to be used in cultural curation. Um, and thinking about 
that how those insurgent absences of embodied knowledge um, are encapsulated by a phrase from the queer critic um, and AIDS activist Douglas Crimp, where he talks about militant melancholia. So the idea that we don't let go of the absences, but we we use the energy of the grief to pre to generate um, exactly the generative works that you've also generously um, been sharing today. And I'm pairing that with the idea of uh, folded time, which uh, Jason Carter uses to talk about uh, gender transitioning and remembering, rewriting, recreating, re-narrating your memories around transition. So re-understanding, uh, as, as Jay was talking about in their own in their video, re-understanding the memory of your own, own body. And that echoed for me in how Janice was talking about having read in a certain way when younger and then encountering texts um, as an adult or through college studies. How do we write the history of those texts back into the times we didn't have them? How do we give themselves to us at an earlier stage of us of an individual or a community? How can we make space? for those not to just be absences, but to be things that were waiting for us or implicit in the ways that we were becoming as readers and viewers. Um, I think sometimes a lot of this work is about giving permission back to ourselves to have longed for these texts and that longing itself to be a presence, even if we didn't know what we were longing for. Um, so that's, sort of my work as a, as a critic and a labor activist is again, as I said, also thinking about the work of this um, as being both physical and emotional and acknowledging the work that has been done today by all the artists who shared and also by Lottie and Susanna and everyone organizing the project and everyone also who's been listening, holding our work. Um, so rather than reading anything, I'm gonna uh, stop and hope to listen to the other people who've been on the call as well. <laughs>